to talk to you for a moment about um, a subject that we all have to deal with. And the Lord began dealing with me about this some time ago. And um, I, I never pulled the trigger on it, so to speak. I never uh, really went into it. I've, I've read the verses of Scripture that I'm going to read uh, many times. I've looked at them many times. I have preached sermons around these verses. And, um, and so, I, you know, I've got a lot of, uh, I guess, um, preaching material that I could use. But uh, that's, that's, really not, uh, that's really not what I want to do today. Um, I want you to go with me to a couple of places. We're going to look at some Old Testament scriptures. We're going to look at a prayer and a psalm, or a psalm and a prayer. And we're going to look at the New Testament understanding of these Old Testament principles so that we can see what to do whenever we get into certain situations in our own lives. And so the title of my message this morning is When the Battle Makes Us Weary. And when the battle makes us weary. In, the, in our modern history, um, we've, we've had several military campaigns over the year, over the, over the course of the last hundred years, let's say. And uh, all of them have been gruesome. All of them have been terrible. None of them have been good. Um, war is uh, just as it has been said. I, I don't know if Patton's the only one that ever said it, but war is hell. And I think every war bears that fact out. And um, because of so many things that go so terribly wrong in the midst of all of it. But back in the early part of the 1900s, uh, we entered a war um, because of Germany, uh, because of something that was going on there, because of, of invasions into France and, and the onslaught in England and different places. Back in 1914, we fought World War I. Nobody ever talks about that one very much because, well, that was just something that happened a long time ago. And the big one that we all know about, because all the movies were made about it, was World War II. And so we see all kinds of stuff about that. But nobody ever talks very much about World War I. World War I was interesting because a new type of warfare took place at that point. We were just coming out of the 1800s. You stop and think, uh, we fought the Revolutionary War at the end of the 1700s. And so uh, at the we're talking just uh, 25 or so years uh, away from the 1800s. And so they were still you know, out there with rocks and spears and, and they had guns and all of that, but they, they would hide behind trees. We know our own American history. They'd hide behind trees and throw stuff at them and, and, and just do anything that they could. They would, instead of uh, just cannonballs, they would put what they would call a uh, uh, grape shot or whatever. They would just, you know, and they would just scatter bomb everybody. You know, it just didn't matter who they got. They just got everybody. And uh, so then about 100 years later, there's been a lot of wars that were fought. Obviously, we know the Civil War um, in the uh, mid-1800s. We know that was a tragedy, and, and, and a lot of people lost their lives. And, but then in the beginning of the uh, 20th century, World War I was a new day because there was just the beginnings of uh, understanding uh, how submarines could really uh, do some damage. It was just an understanding that there may be a machine that you could fly in the air that would that would do some so the the weaponry was becoming more sophisticated, but the guys on the ground uh, <clears throat> still had to fight each other. And so in World War One, they dug these trenches, and the trenches were about from this step to about the end of this carpet right here. So you're looking at a good five and a half, six feet maybe max, and these things didn't go just a few feet; they went thousands of feet. They dug these trenches and they called it trench warfare. You've heard the terminology. If you ever studied American history uh, you, or world history, you know that they called it trench warfare. The, about 50 to 80 to 100 yards out in front of those trenches was a place called no man's land. 
And so these guys would come out and they would fight and they would go out into no man's land and boy, it was just a free for all. Um, some of the guns they used were, they worked. Some of them didn't work. I mean, read the, the read the stories. I've read so many stories about it and, and, and it's just intriguing to me how they fought. And um, they sometimes the guns would fire, sometimes they wouldn't. After two or three shots, it would get so hot they couldn't keep firing. And it wasn't rapid fire the way we understand it today. It was just it was the way they did it, and it was the best they had at the time. But a lot of times it's just hand-to-hand combat with swords and uh, bayonets on the ends of their guns and stuff like that, just whatever they had at hand. And um, But those guys, all li- both sides, they just kind of lived out there in those trenches. Read your history. Look at, they even have old uh, archives of, um, of film and pictures and things that you can see of this stuff. The tragedy of the trench warfare was not so much going and running into a ditch so you could hide from the in- enemy. That wasn't the tragedy. The tragedy of trench warfare was that after they would fight, they would retreat to their trenches guys would limp in, come back half alive, half dead and they would die in those trenches and so the disease and the vermin and the and there's, there's reports in fact there is video footage now that's been taken from some newsreels back in the day the wild hogs would come and start eating the bodies. I'm going to get a little graphic here this morning because war is hell. <clears throat> and uh so they would, and they, and they would be not only fighting the enemy, but they'd be fighting these animals off of their friends who were in the process of dying. And, and the disease was rampant, and they couldn't, they were, it was the bathroom. There was no place to go. That was just it. They couldn't get clean. There was no water. Supplies were limited and cut off many of times. And not only could they see that happening, but they would, uh, they would hear their buddies out there in no man's land, screaming and crying, come help me, come help me. And nobody could go help because the minute you stick your head up, you're dead. And, uh, and it went on and on and on and on and on. There was no release. There was no, it was, it was relentless. And then the bombing that they did, the particular kind of bombing that they did, because it was archaic, it was the most sophisticated for that day, but it was very archaic. And it just went, it was like, It was like the worst, absolute worst 4th of July night of your life because it would not end. It would go on and on and on and on. And they, uh, there would be guys when they came back from the war, there's also footage of this, you can watch it, Uh, men who would come back from the war and they would go to the doctors uh, and, 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 and they would look normal on the outside, but they absolutely would just, they, it was like they had a, a, a palsy or like they were, uh, you know, had Parkinson's disease or something like that. They absolutely couldn't get a fork to their mouth. They, somebody had to feed them because they had what a new term came up. It's called shell shock. I don't know if you've ever met anybody that has shell shock, but I have. There's a man in my dad's church, and I interviewed him. He was in World War I. This was a long time ago. I got to interview him when I was a teenager in high school, and uh, he was in his 80s back then, so we're talking the 70s, and he was already in his 80s. And, uh, but he had been in World War I, and he was shell-shocked, and you couldn't even walk up beside that guy and touch him on the shoulder. He would go nuts, not in a bad way. It just scared him so bad, and he, and he shook all the time. After the war was over, the war was still going on in him. You get the picture? Trench warfare. <clears throat> the devil doesn't care what he does to you. and He doesn't care how he does it. As long as he puts his mark on you. And sometimes in life, this battle gets to going so long and so far and there's so much of it and it seems so strong and so horrendous that that the battle is inside of us it's it's beyond a fight out here it has come on the inside of us and we're like those guys who are have shell shock they they can't they just can't function in daily life hardly because they've had this garbage that's just they they've ingested it and digested it and it's become a part of their life the devil wants to do the same thing to every Christian. Um, and there's a couple of things that 
that uh, we can look at in our natural. How many of you have ever heard that that when you when lightning happens, it doesn't come from the sky and go to the ground, but it happens on the ground and goes up? Have you ever heard that? Well, that's only partially true because that's impossible for that to be the case 100%. Um, lightning comes from the sky, and then what we see as a flash is from the ground. Because in the atmosphere, there is a negative set of things. I'm not going to go into the technical terms because I don't know them. There's a negative set, a negative charged particle that comes from the sky that we cannot see with our naked eye. Think about that for a minute. The only way we would ever know that lightning existed is if we saw a visible rep- representation of it. You can't see lightning come from the sky to the ground. You can't see it. But when those negatively charged particles come down to earth, they touch positively charged particles, and we see a big flash. And that's why they say it goes from the ground up. Because it's it's like 100 milliseconds of a second, whatever that is. I don't even know how they can measure that. But it's that quick, and it happens so fast we can't see it. So the answer is, where does lightning come from, the sky or the ground? The answer is both. But the part that we can't see is the negatively charged particles. We can't see that. All we can see is the aftermath. In the same way, The devil tries to do that to us as believers. There are things we can't see in the heavenlies. A lot of people say, well, I'm not going to believe that there is any such thing as spiritual warfare. Well, enjoy your life and enjoy your coma uh, because it's just not true. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And so the, the, the warfare rages, and it, the war is on right now. In fact, Ecclesiastes says it like this. It says there's no escape from that war. There's no release from that war. And so you'll always be fighting sin. You'll always be fighting temptation. You'll always be fighting those things. But how many of you know it's a good fight? Hallelujah. The Apostle Paul said, I'm going to fight the good fight of faith. It's a good fight. The reason I think he said it's a good fight is because he knew at the end he is victorious. He's the winner. But I believe that there's more to it than that. And that's what I want to talk about. Because sometimes in the midst of a battle, we get weary. We think in terms of of, uh, just living at peace. You know, if I'm a Christian, then I just live at peace for the rest of my life. And I I trust that that's the case because... Uh, He is the Prince of Peace, therefore I am at peace. But that doesn't mean that our world will not get rocked sometimes. So having peace, uh, that's that's, uh, that's something different than uh, uh, having no trouble whatsoever. Peace and struggle uh, go hand in hand at the same time. There's a pastor very many years ago, and he said this. He said, his name is A.W. Tozier. If you've ever read any of his books, um, you know he's a great writer and a great minister. He said that this world is a playground instead of a battleground has now been accepted in practice by the vast majority of Christians. Let me say that again, that this world is a playground instead of a battleground has now been accepted in practice by the vast majority of Christians. Every one of us in this room are involved in spiritual warfare, whether you want to be or not. It's a fact of life. Nobody's exempt. But there's a time sometimes when the battle gets to such a fevered pitch that we just can't seem to go on. And in fact, we sort of mentally give up. Um, And in reality, our internal giving up is the very essence of spiritual warfare. That is what the devil's goal is, by the way. The devil's goal is to get you to give up, back off, back down from your confession, back down from who you are in Christ. That's his goal in spiritual warfare. In fact, his goal is to get you so emotionally charged and so emotionally scattered that you say to yourself over and over again, not one time, he's not trying to just get you to say it one time, he wants you to repeat this to yourself over and over and over, I'm just going to give up. 
I'm just going to give up. I'm just going to quit. It's too much trouble. I'm going to give up. A lot of people, they put on a good show externally, but on the inside, they've talked themselves out of any solution that makes sense. I'm talking to myself today, but I'm talking to a group of people this morning that understands the Word of God. Our tendency then is to revert back to whatever was comfortable or familiar in the past. We say things like, I tried doing it God's way. Things got worse, so I'm just going to figure it out on my own. You don't have any idea how many times me, as a pastor, have heard, has, I've heard that. I've heard that come out of people's mouth. I tried to do it God's way. It didn't work out, so I'm going to go do it on my own. But I promise you this, that's not going to make it any better. The battle will still rage. It's not so much the battle itself as it is the length of the battle that makes us weary. And there comes a breaking point a lot of times, and that's where we find the hero of our story today. Uh, his name was David. If you go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 21, I want to read a few verses to you. At this point where I'm going to bring you today, David is already, he, he was the shepherd boy, killed the lion and the bear, he tended his father's sheep, all of those things. He had, um, he had already killed Goliath in this uh, verse of Scripture. Uh, he was he already had the king's daughter. Um, it, most everybody looking at him from the natural would say, "This guy's got it made. He's the king's son-in-law. He's the next in line." I mean, this is this is a great thing. But the situation is, his father-in-law is now set to kill him. Now, that's a bad father-in-law son-in-law relationship right there. I don't care who you are. And uh, so Saul set out to kill David. And uh, he went nuts. He really did. He went nuts with jealousy. How many of you know that a person who is jealous and bitter, there is not a thing you can do for them. Just let them go. Just let them go. Listen to me. Just let them go because they're going to end up in a mess themselves. When a person is offended, hurt, jealous, bitter, all that kind of stuff, you cannot reason with them. All you can do is do what I'm going to tell you to do uh, today, and that's to pray for them because it, it, you, you cannot stop that, that spirit that drives them to that. You, only the Holy Spirit can uh, uh, cast out that spirit that drives them in that bitterness and that fury and that rage. And so David did everything in his power to uh, appease Saul. He did everything in his power. He played the harp whenever he was in a mad state of mind. And he, he did all kinds of uh, good things. He never hurt him. Even his own uh, Saul's own son asked his dad, said, why have you lost your mind like this and trying to kill David? He's never done anything to you, but be nice. Why would you even do this? And so Saul's now gone crazy. He's trying to kill him, so he's hunting him down, and he's chasing him. And I want to read 1 Samuel uh, chapter 21, some verses of Scripture here. It says, now David came to Nob. It's a funny word. But uh, it actually, in the Hebrew text, means nothing. He came to nothing. It's very interesting, the choice of words here. Came to Nob, to, um, to Ahimelech the priest. Now, Nob is an area in Gibeah where the tabernacle of Moses still was in existence, by the way. And so he went down to, to that same area near Gibeah. This is, and, and he was running from Saul. He was trying to get away from Saul. And um, he was trying to, to just stay out of his line of fire, so to speak. And so um, when he went to Elimelech the priest, Ahimelech was afraid whenever he met David. And he said to him, listen to this, David, why are you alone and no one is with you? So David said these words to Ahimelech the priest. The king has ordered me on some business. That's a lie. The king did not order David to go to Nob to him elect the priest. David lied like a rug. And he said to me, do not let anyone know anything about the business on which I send you. That's a lie. He never told him to do that. Or what I have commanded you, and I have directed my young men to such and such a place. That's a lie. None of that was why David was alone. None of that. David was scared to death, literally shaking in his boots. He had tried and tried and tried to appease Saul, but this battle had gone on 
and on and on, and there was no end in sight. The only thing he thought he could do was run. And how many of you know that sometimes when you start running, you start lying? I'll just let that sink in for a minute. Now drop on down with me. Uh, he gave him some bread to eat. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not going to get into that. Drop down into verse 8. Then David said to Ahimelech, Is there not here on hand a spear or a sword? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's business required haste. That's a lie. So the priest said, well, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed, David, down there in the Valley of Elah. You remember that? His sword is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will, take that. Take it. For there is no other except that one here. This is a tabernacle, this church house. We don't carry a lot of swords around here, bud. <laughs> So David said, well, there's no sword like it. Give it to me. Then David rose and fled that day from before Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. Here is the insanity of somebody where the battle has gotten so rough and so strong and so seemingly impossible. He goes to Gath. Have you ever read in the book where Goliath lived? Gath. So he runs to the city where Goliath was born and raised and all five of his uh, family members. There, were, there was Goliath and four other brothers. That were still, his other brothers were still alive, by the way. And, and, so, and so he goes down there to Goliath. Achish, king of Gath. That's the enemy. The enemy. He runs to the enemy. Y'all can see where I'm headed with this, can't you? And the servants of Achish, the king, said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? See, they, everybody else had already figured out David was smarter than Saul, and he's really probably the king of the land. In other words, it's one thing to be the ruler in title, but it's another thing to be the man with the influence, and David had the influence. Did they not sing of him to one another in dances, saying, Saul has slain thousands, but David has ten thousands? Now David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. Can you see these guys saying this to uh, the king, all of his leaders? They were saying, hey, don't, this is David king. Why are you taking this guy in? He, he's killed He's killed the strongest and biggest guy in our land, and you're going to let this guy come in? the stupidity of David to go down there where a bunch of people wanted to kill him anyway. But hey, when you're running and the battle gets so heavy and so weary that you can't see your way out of it, how many of you know you'll do some crazy things? And so David took these words to heart. He was afraid of Achish, king of Gath, and he changed his behavior. Everybody say he changed. He changed his behavior before them. He pretended insanity or madness in their hands. He scratched on the doors of the gate and let saliva fall down on his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Look, you see this man is insane. Why have you brought him to me? Don't I, do I need any more madmen? I've got all you guys around anyway. Do I need any more crazy people? Why would you bring this fellow in to play the madman in my presence? Shall he come into my house? In verse number 1 of chapter 22, David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. So he became captain over them. Yay. Become captain over a bunch of disgruntled, upset people. <sighs> That's humorous to me, by the way. Apparently not so much to y'all. Now go with me to Psalm 57. Psalm 57, verse number 1, says these words. 
Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. Everybody say that out loud. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. This is David writing. He says, For my soul trusts in you, and in the shadow of your wings I'll make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. If you read the NIV, it says, Until the disaster is over. Now, everybody reads the Psalms and they fail to read anything but the words in the Psalms. But if you'll just back up under the heading Psalm 57, it says these words in the Bible, some form of these words in your Bible even, prayer for safety from enemies. To the chief musician set to the musical song that had already been written previously, do not destroy a mictum, a mictum is a, uh, is, would be like a song or a, a, an ode, a, a song of David when he fled from Saul into the cave. Psalm 57 was written whenever David fled from Saul into the cave. He said, be merciful to me, be merciful to me. It's important to notice that what cave? Well, it's a dullum. It was back then, and it still is now, down near the Dead Sea. I've been there several times. I've actually gone up to the mouth of the cave, stepped in. They let me walk around up there, not on this trip, but previous trips. We were just down there not too long ago, here a few months ago, and we fed birds with our guide, Abby. And uh, there was a bunch of birds flying up. You remember that, Richard? Those birds were coming up there, and he kept feeding them. And and, uh, we had just come from the Dead Sea and Qumran and all those different places. And we went to the very cave there in the Wadi En Gedi where David ran from Saul. And um, it's, it's a big hack to get up in there, by the way. It's very remote. You can't see it from the trail. It was probably a place that David had been so many times as a boy when he was feeding his father's sheep, before he'd been anointed by Samuel, before he'd killed Goliath, before he married the king's daughter, before all the trouble that had come with his calling. Before all the trouble that had come, before he was called, the stuff that come along with it. God has called you to do certain things. What happens sometimes, the devil knows what your calling is, and therefore he tries to kill you, tries to stop you from doing it. But verse 1 of this psalm is very interesting to me because it says, Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. Have you ever been so squashed in your spirit Have you ever been so weary from the fight and weary from the battle that when you prayed, it seemed like that wasn't enough and you had to say it again? That's what this is. He prayed the first time, be merciful to me. It's not just a, it's not because he wanted to repeat a section of a song so they would make up a good song. He was at the end of his rope. He thought he was about to die and he said, God, be merciful to me. Now, I'm making this part up, but I can just, because I've done it before. I'm like, hello, God. I said, be merciful to me. You know what I'm talking about? It had gotten to such a place, the emotionally charged atmosphere that he was in was so difficult and so strong. He felt so helpless. He was so scared. He was so weary. And he prayed. He said, I guess I got to say that again. Be merciful to me. That's the intensity of this prayer. It is a song, but it is a prayer. It is a prayer. David was running to save his life. He was trying to get out of harm's way. But the battle had become so intense and he had become so weary from the fight that he began to revert back to familiar things, past methods of defense. He went and he ate day old bread I don't have time to get into the imagery of it but the only bread in the tabernacle was a day old it says so in the book he ate day old bread if you don't get fresh manna from God every day you're going to just be a stale believer amen and so he goes and does something that he probably shouldn't have done anyway but he did it it sustained him to some degree and then he picked up a an instrument he picked up a a weapon from a past victory 
And uh, that's a lesson for all of us. And when the battle gets so weary and, and, and we're so wearied and worried and scared during the battle, a lot of times we'll go up and pick up something that we use, something that we knew, something that from the past, we pick that up and try to fight today's battle with an old weapon. But my Bible says in the book of Second Corinthians that the, uh, uh, that the weapons of my warfare, they're not carnal, they're not humanly inspired, but they are divinely inspired of God. And they're always casting down imaginations, always pulling down strongholds, always knocking out anything that would raise itself up against the knowledge of God. And so if I try to win today's battle with yesterday's weaponry, I'm in trouble. And David was in trouble. That's one of the reasons we get so weary in the battle is because we're trying to fight today's battle on a past victory or we're trying to fight today's battle with past weapons or we're trying to fight today's battle with something from our past. And you can't do that. It makes your, the, your emotions make your, uh, uh, the battle will make your emotions just go crazy. And, and if you, I don't have time to do all of this because uh, it would take me quite a while to teach this whole chapter here. But if you look in verses 1 and verses 4 of Psalm 57, verses 6 and verses 7, you will see David's condition of his heart is interesting. He, it was the same man, it was the same heart, the same cave, the same battle at the same time. And he says these different things. He says, my soul trusts in thee. How many of you know that's a great thing? And then right on the hill of that, my soul is among lions. He goes from trusting in God to going, yeah, but I'm about to be killed. I know none, let's don't be harsh on him because I think maybe some of us have been in that same boat before. One minute we're trusting in God, the next mind, yeah, but they're going to get us. I hear this all the time. I believe in God, but I know I'm going to die. You know, it's, that's, you know, that's uh, almost spiritual schizophrenia. But don't be harsh on David because I've been right there. I've been that same guy in that same cave fighting that same battle. Amen. And I know you have too. He said, my soul is among lions. And then he says, my soul is bowed down. You know, he was all, and, and then in, in the next verse, he says, my heart is fixed. <laughs> well, praise God. Amen. Which is it, David? All of them. Because I've been right there. I've been right there. I know what it's like. He goes from trust in the Lord, saying there's no way out because the people are, that are chasing him are lions. And they're, in fact, it says, they're, uh, it says their teeth are sharp. How many of you know it would be horrible to be shredded by a lion's teeth? But if you read, it, it, listen to this. This is just interesting to me, and I, I think I want you to just see it. This is verse 4. My soul is among lions. I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows. How many of you know spears and arrows being chunked? You can hide, you can duck, you can dodge. Listen to the, and their tongue is a sharp sword. There's the problem. We don't mind people hitting us. We hate it when they start accusing us, though, and when they start talking, and when they start wagging that sword of the tongue. Come on, somebody. That's why David was saying all these things. He's, he's all crushed on the inside when he says, my soul is bowed down. Then all of a sudden, his heart gets fixed. And I've been in every bit of that. So I can't accuse him. I can't say anything negative. Uh, I can't say that it won't happen to me again either. I, I don't want it to, but it could happen. Extended battles will have this effect on us. It is spiritual warfare at its finest. The devil will do whatever he can for as long as he can to try to get you to curse God and die. And by the way, nobody in this room is Job. I just want you to know that. That story's over and it doesn't exist anymore. And nobody else is, in any way, the whole, the whole thing only took less than eight months to accomplish. And all 42 chapters happened in less than eight months. So you're not dying, not yet. Go ahead and say, praise God. Amen. But the devil will do whatever he can to get you to think that you're that way. You don't have to let it happen. Because the Bible says that I'm more than a conqueror through 
Christ Jesus who loves me. I am more than a conqueror through Christ who loves me. When the devil says it's all over, I know that that's a lie. You know what I know? When I hear in my head the devil say to me, it's all over, it's all going to go down the tubes, it's everything's... When I hear that in my mind, my first response now, not used to, but now my first response is, shut up, devil, you've always been a liar. What that means is, is you're scared I'm about to win. And I am about to win. Come on, somebody. I'm about to win. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I will, you know, we, we have to, we have to uh, say what God's word says. We have to not be dismayed and say what God says about us. If, he, if the devil says it's over, that means that we're just about to begin. Uh, when the sharp teeth and the tongues of your accusers are on your heels and when the doctor says you won't recover, when the bank says that uh, uh, the bank account is showing slow signs of recovery and it feels like you're in a cave, and there, which is nothing more than a grave with a hole in it where you can get out, by the way. Come on, somebody. Go up into that opening and just declare out loud, I will live and not die in this cave. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Even if you have to run and go down to Ziklag with a bunch of guys that are in the same problem you're in, get down there with them and have yourself a party. Amen? Now, quickly, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. It says, finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Let's go to the next verse. <clears throat> no, that you went backwards. <clears throat> finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything else, just stand Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. You know, it's hard to do anything for God unless you're telling the truth and doing what's right. Glory to God. That's a sure place to get a good amen. So I thought, amen. But you, you, do, it with, you do it with truth. And with a breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of the peace. It says uh, in the King James Version, the preparation of the gospel of peace, which means a sure foundation of the gospel message of Jesus Christ and who he is. We're on firm foundation. Can you say amen? In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith which, uh, with which you can extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation. This has to do with protecting your thought life. And uh, uh, the helmet of salvation, which is, I should have brought it out here. I've got a sword in my office. The helmet of salvation, take this, the word of God, it says then. It says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. Say it with me. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. The sword of the spirit is God's word. The sword that the Holy Spirit has to use in your life to defeat the devil is God's word. Oh, but I just thought he'd come in and pull his sword out. No, the sword of the spirit is God's word. And if you don't have the word of God on the inside of you, the Holy Spirit has no handle to grab a hold of. So you have to have the word inside of you. And if the word's not, in, not inside this book, we've got the word inside this book. That's a given. But this word has to go here. And then down into here. And then the Holy Spirit has something he can grab a hold of to help you fight the enemy with. I don't know how else to preach it or how else to say it. If you don't have the word of God inside of you, if you don't know the word of God to stand on, you will always be scared. You'll always be fearful. You'll always be frightened. You'll always be afraid. You'll always have no hope. You'll always think that you're about to lose. You're always going to think that you're about to die. You're always going to think that it's over, that nothing's ever going to change, that it's all bad, that it's just, you know, I might as well go out in the wood and eat worms and die or whatever. 
and you start talking foolish things and you do what David did and you start spitting saliva all out your mouth and, and scratching on the walls acting like a weirdo. <laughs> Come on. But if the word's on the inside of you, then you've got something to live for. Can you say amen? And you've got something that the Holy Spirit can work with. And then it says this, and, everybody say and, and pray in the Spirit. And pray in the Spirit. It says praying always. How many times are we supposed to pray? Always. Well, brother, I thought that you could only pray once over an issue and then you're not in faith. Would you just read the Bible and do what it says? It says, pray always. I didn't write this book. I'm not, all I'm doing is telling you what it says. Amen. Pray always. Well, which kind of prayer? Should it be a pr- uh, uh, imprecatory prayer? Should it be a uh, intercessory prayer? Should it be a foundational prayer? Should it be a heavenly prayer? Should it be just pray a prayer? Amen. Just pray a prayer. Praying always with all prayer. All prayer. Short prayers. Long prayers. Medium prayers. Half a prayer. Three quarters of a prayer. Ten prayers tied together. Listen to your friends pray. Still it. Pray that one. All kinds of prayers. I'm not advocating theft. I'm just saying. I've heard people pray before and go, my goodness, why didn't I think of that? I just want to pray. That's right. God is good. I forgot that. (laughs) We pray all kinds of goofy stuff. My grand, I better not. (laughs) I'm going to. My grandfather used to have us pray. (laughs) He, He was about... 200 years old. But anyway, we'd go to his house to stay. And at nine o'clock every night, it was the hour of prayer. The hour of prayer. (laughs) It was not the sweet hour of prayer. It was just the hour of prayer. We used to sing a song in church. How many remember? Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer. Be my soul as ever. I was like, God, deliver me from this hour of prayer. <laughs> it didn't hurt me any, though. But you had to sit there and pray. We'd kneel down. I'll never forget as long as I can still see it. I can still feel the terror. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I mean, we would kneel down and my grandfather would get to pray and you, you'd hear him. He would go to another room by himself. Lord God, thank you. Hallelujah, Lord God. We just praise you for this day. You know, it was all coherent. <laughs> seemingly wise. <laughs> and, and within just a few short minutes, it would become, oh my goodness. I'm like, okay, wait. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I'm not making fun of him. I'm just making a little fun of him. Um, God bless his heart. He 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 taught us how to pray. He taught us, the discipline of prayer, I'll say that. He taught us the discipline of prayer. But if you went to grandpa's house, you prayed every night at 9 o'clock, whether you wanted to or not, whether you were saved or not. All my cousins that hated God, I, re- I know why my aunts and uncles hated God. I could see it right there. They hated church. They hate, they didn't want nothing to do with it. I can understand it. I was kind of scared of him at the moment. <laughs> but, I mean, he would just well on for a solid hour. And you could count on it, man. It was a solid hour. And God help your soul if you got up. How he knew that you got up when he was in another room, I don't know. I'll never know to this day how he knew that. But when he did, he would come in there and he would have a belt in his hand. I'm like, Grandpa, you can't even see me in here. How do you know that I wasn't praying? I'd always try to get, I ain't got time. I'd try to get a toy and stuff, but... Anyway, sweet hour of prayer became the discipline of prayer. But he taught me the discipline of it, praying always with all prayer, even those strange ones. Amen. That's why I'm still alive today. Is because I heard my grandpa praying. I can make fun of it now. I couldn't then, though. He'd have beat me within an inch of my life. 
but grandpa showed us how to pray for sure taught us the discipline of it my dad was a lot more peaceful he taught me really the ins and outs of prayer and a little more sweeter way to do it praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance everybody say all perseverance i'm done matt would you come this morning When the battle makes us weary, we've got to do what the Word says. There's no alternative. We can run like David. We can act like a madman. We can do whatever. But we have to come to the place that even though the battle makes us weary, and we may feel like we're in the trenches and we hear the screams and the moans and the cries of everybody else, and even your own mental and physical well-being may have a problem going on you pray there's something about prayer you see here's the thing about spiritual warfare that i want to get across this morning we think a lot of times that spiritual warfare is this uh extra outwardly external fight that the devil's duking it out with some some good angels up in the sky over our heads and whereas that may be a truth that may be a truth that is not all of the truth that's just one part of the truth the truth of the matter is the warfare is fought the battle itself is found in prayer that's where the battle is spiritual warfare's battle is in prayer why do you think that you and don't look at anybody you just keep straight looking straight ahead why do you think that it's so hard for you to find a place to pray why do you think that it's so hard we will we'll listen to a thousand preachers tell us five steps on how to get an answer from god We'll buy every book. We'll send it, send in a thousand now. God promises ten thousand. First of all, not in the Bible, but we'll do it every time. Buy this book. Find out the fifteen ways on how God. Here, here's fifteen prayers that you're supposed to pray when you're in trouble. What if you lose the book? <sighs> do I pray number twelve, number six, number seven? Which one do I pray? And the battle is in prayer itself. You may think, well, what if I don't pray the right one? Well, that's why it says pray in the Spirit. Because if you're praying in the Spirit, you can't pray the wrong prayer. Well, I must have been praying the wrong prayer. No, the devil is fighting you. That's the issue. There's a war going on. Just because you haven't seen the answer doesn't mean that the answer is not on the way. Daniel prayed. And it's very specific in the Bible. It said the prince of Persia fought Michael and and the the uh, Gabriel and the and the battle couldn't happen until that battle in the heavenlies was taken care of. He said, "I would have been here 21 days sooner, but thank God you kept praying that whole time." Daniel prayed. He kept praying every day. Never saw an answer. Never saw a flitter. Never saw a feather. And then all of a sudden, the angel shows up. Probably because angels don't have it. anyway. <clears throat> They never saw any visible sign. But 21 late days later, the angel came and said, I would have been here earlier, but I was hindered. You may say, well, it's been longer than 21 days. Well, I don't know how long your battle's going to last. I don't know how immediate the urgency is. I don't know. And neither do you, and neither does anybody else. That's between you and God. But I know this, I'm going to pray always with all kinds of prayer in the spirit what kind of battles do we fight ongoing demonic harassment over our past physical illness there's a battle that'll wear you out over time false accusations that won't go away there's a battle that'll wear you out Self-inflicted stress over things you can't control anyway, that will wear you out. 
I know what it's like to be in such of a dysfunctional, emotional state. There have been times in my life when the phone would ring and I'd cry because I didn't know who was going to be on the other end, what ugly things were going to get said. I've been there. Fear, hurts, bitterness. That, that's hurts and bitterness. Let me tell you something. If you don't get rid of that, that will haunt you for the rest of your life. You will live in hell while you're alive. You won't need to go to hell after this life is over. You will have done all the time you can do doing that hurt and bitter thing. That is the most ungodly, demonic thing. And we're, you know, well, you know, we're okay with hurts and bitterness. As long as we keep that to ourselves, it's none of anybody's business. We're going to be the bigger man, the better, whatever. You're going to die in it. I'm just, I'm not warning you. I am challenging you. You're going to die with that mess. Worries, anxieties, over finances or whatever, marital unrest, an unfaithful spouse or a hateful spouse. You don't know what they say to me. Yeah, but God does. Bring it to the Lord. What about wayward children? What about dreams that have not been realized? What about being mad at God because you think he didn't respond to you when you ask him to? What about just simple disappointments, the death of a loved one or shame? Or just spiritual dryness. God, where are you? I, it's like I'm, I'm in a desert here. And the list goes on and on. But the battle is in prayer. That's where you fight and that's where you win. Having done all, stand. So I'm going to ask you to stand this morning. I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm inviting you today to come to the Lord in the middle of your battle in the middle of your battle. In the middle of your battle. The fight right now for some of us may be really intense. And the victory may seem out of reach. But we still come to Jesus. Because He's our only salvation. We still come to Him. Instead of doing what David did and reverting back to old ways and old habits, our own strength, why not lay it down at Jesus' feet instead? Everybody needs some relief in the middle of a battle. If you feel the relentless pressure of battle, do what Paul told us to do and pray in the Spirit. And then keep on praying. Bring it to God. And keep on moving forward. God wants to just wrap us in His arms. Some of you are fighting such an intensity of battle in your own heart, and your own spirit right now that... You do not see, in fact, you don't feel like there's any way out because something has happened that has caused too strong of a rift. I don't even know why I'm saying this. I just feel compelled to say it. There's something has caused too much of a rift and it can't be fixed or it can't be remedied or it can't be taken care of. And that's exactly where the devil wants you. That's exactly what he wants to do to you because if he can do that to you, then you'll give up. You'll give up. You'll quit. When the battle makes you weary, don't run. Don't start lying. Don't start taking weapons from the past. Don't, don't go back on commit. Don't, don't, don't do that stuff. You'll end up in a cave. You'll end up in a cave. It won't be pretty. So today, I offer you the only thing that I know. And that's Jesus. He's the only thing that I know that can solve any of this. And his word tells us if we'll bring it to him, well, pastor, what if I pray and nothing happens? Then keep praying. I've had people ask, Bishop and I have had this conversation before about people saying, well, what do you do if you pray for people and they don't get healed? I say, I go to the next one and pray for them. Well, what do you do if you ask people to be saved and they don't get saved? I go to the next one and ask them, do they want to be saved? Why? Because God's Word works. God's Word works. And I, 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 I'm not going to make any apologies for God's Word. That it, this is the, the battle is strong and the battle is intense. I agree with that. I understand it. I, I'm a human. I go through the same kind of battles. 
But the only solace that I have is to bring it to Jesus in prayer and keep on praying. So this morning, if you say, Pastor, you know what? The battle has been intense. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray my way through this today. And you, you feel in your heart that you want to respond. I want every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. And you say, Pastor, I want to respond because this is for everybody. This is an, I'm not talking about salvation. Uh, if you're not born again in this room this morning, talk to me. I'll tell you how to ask Jesus into your heart. It's, that, it's very simple. But this morning, this is for everybody. If you feel the intensity of the battle and you say, Pastor, I want to bring this to the Lord and I want to lay it at His feet this morning. Something that you said, something from the Word of God has sparked something in me and I know that today is my day for victory. If that's you, would you just make your way up here to the front? We're going to pray together. As they begin to sing this song, right?